We are on our second week of Revelation. We know and we've kind of sensed and people have spoken about this book. And there's a somewhat of a nervous uh, expectation or anticipation of where this book's going to go. Um, it's a book that's caused, in some ways, much division within the church because there's different perspectives on what the book is saying, what it's predicting, what it's not predicting, and all of those good things. And uh, one of the things, though, is that I, we want to make sure is last year we did a What Is God One series. And we painted a picture, an overarching narrative of the story of God, His story, so that we understand why we're doing Revelation. And we looked back, and then what we did is we looked at discipleship. How do we live out our lives based on this story that we've just gone through? And then ultimately what we're doing with Revelation is looking at what that means for us now and going forward. And so there is a reason why we're doing this. And there's intelligent evil in this world. And we need to understand that there's more to every moment in our lives. There's more to every moment actually in history than we actually understand or can perceive in it with our emotions, our imagination, and even within our intellect. And people can try and understand that, but there's only one way to understand that, and it's through the Spirit. But God has revealed this through His Spirit and through His Word. And in some ways, no more powerfully and creatively and compellingly than the book of Revelation. And I've always been, to be honest, quite fearful. It's maybe not the right word. It maybe overstates it, but anxious about this particular book because I, I never really understood it. But I've loved unpacking it and preparing for these messages. And it is the most profound book that has been written that actually, as I said last week, Eugene Peterson says that uh, you need to have read all the rest of the Bible because nothing's actually, no, nothing new is said in the Revelation. It's all pointing back to the Old Testament. The most quoted uh, uh, book, or it quotes the Old Testament more than any other New Testament book. Anyway, let's get going. Remember, this is the big slide that we did for What Does God Want? And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Go listen to last week's preach. Louise and I did kind of an interview around it. But remember, God's created. We've had two rebellions. I mean, three rebellions. We've got the one in the Garden of Eden where death came. We've got Genesis 6 where we go. If you go read Genesis 6 and you, you hear about these watches and these Nephilim and what are these people and kind of just says it and then moves on um, and what, what they were all about. And, and they came and they taught sorcery and how humanity to go to a, a greater depth of depravity and then what we've got is genesis 10 and 11 where what starts to happen is the guitar of babel third one god disinherits the nations um and then the abrahamic covenant god starts with a new nation called israel and then ultimately what happens is is the restoration through what jesus did on the cross he deals with all three rebellions he deals with the death issue he deals with the sin issue he deals with the nations, and he brings them back. And I read Psalm 2, ask of me and I'll give you the nations. And that's why Jesus went to Philippi, Caesarea, or Caesarea Philippi. And that's where he did the Mount Transfiguration. That's where he said to his disciples, who do you think I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He basically stood at the front door of, of intelligent evil and said, come and get me. He went to go pick a fight, and that's why a week later he had been crucified. And so it's for, important for us to understand this. But ultimately, we're going to land up with the Lamb upon the throne. And we talked about very briefly that ultimately Revelation is about Team Dragon and Team Lamb. There's only two teams. You can't ever put in both. There's Team Dragon, which is part of Babylon and the world system. Or you've got Team Lamb, which is the kingdom of God, where we submit ourselves to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and His name is Jesus. So Revelation is a, very much a pastoral letter. John was pastor to all these seven churches, which we're going to get to know quite intimately over the next couple of months. And it's actually intended to be read aloud. So this morning, we're going to read it aloud. You know what we're also going to do? We're going to stand. We, we haven't done that in the church. So we visitors. We don't do that. But actually, I've, I've loved the fact that as I've studied this and I've, I've listened to people preach on it, let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Now, you don't have to stand. But I'm going to encourage you to stand as we hear. And we're actually going to play it on a YouTube clip and with the words rolling. But I'm actually going to ask you, try and close your eyes and listen. And you'll see why I'm asking you to do that. Because the best way for us to see is to hear. 
And I love what uh, Martin Luther says. It says, stick your eyes in your ears. <laughs> so I want you to stick your eyes in the, your ears this morning. That as we read the scripture, close your eyes, listen. And in some ways, if you can actually listen to this whole book from start to finish in one sitting, I think it takes about 19, 20 minutes. If you can do that, just to and listen, because when we start to listen and we hear, we start to see what Jesus is saying. And throughout the book of Revelation, he says, listen or hear. And then he says, look. Hear, look. And it happens many, many, many times. And you know that thing of faith comes by hearing. Now we all say hearing the word of God, but go read the text. This is one thing that I want to encourage you to do. Is on one level, yes, read the Bible, but don't, don't now uh, live your life on based on your superficial understanding of what it is. The word there is not logos, which is word. It's not the scriptures. The word there is evangelion. And what does evangelion mean? Good news, the gospel. So it's actually when we hear the gospel, we hear the good news of Jesus, which is actually what Revelation is about. And I was listening to a guy, Halstead, this, this, this week. It was a, an interview. He's about to release his book on Revelation on the 7th of Feb on Kindle. And Louise studied under him last year. And so we, we're really keen to hear what he's got to say. So he's been interviewed and he said, the, the book of Revelation is all about the gospel. And the gospel brings peace and the gospel brings joy. And if you're not landing up in that place, you're reading Revelation incorrectly. It is not a book that should bring, bring fear. And you'll see I'll go into that in a moment. So it's very important for us to understand that when we read an interpret or a translation of the Bible, remember it was originally written in a different language. And often what we can do is take a word and then we go, oh, we must read the word of God. Now, yes, but actually read the gospel. Read the message that is in the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's when faith comes. When we hear it and it drops down and we stick, it in our, our, we stick our eyes in our ears so we can see what is being said. So, so I don't know if you noticed that the first line says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So if you start to get fearful or if you start to not understand, just bring it back to Jesus. Hopefully every single message that you hear around this series here at Lifehouse Church, Jesus will be at the center of every single message because this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's important for us to understand that because it's, the title is also Revelation. I know when you often speak to people, oh, have, you, have you read the book of Revelations? There's no S on the end. It's a revelation. As much as there are revelations in Revelation, it's the book of Revelation. And it's a book of Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ, about the person of Jesus Christ. As simple as that. And so I want to ask you, what do you understand the word apocalypse to mean? The Greek word, as you can see, is ap ap uh, apocalypse. And that's the Greek kind of spelling in terms of the Greek alphabet. When I say apocalypse, what, what kind of draws to your mind? Drama, end of the world, Armageddon, chaos. Do you know that that's totally the wrong definition of the word? And yet what we have in our world today is most people think it's something bad, as we've just said. Most people think you see these titles, apocalypse now. And you hear these news titles when something goes down and it's the apocalypse this and the apocalypse that. And even I think it wasn't an X-Men, was the apocalypse now. And so for, the, for a, a first century person, this was a foreign, if they came and listened to, to us and, and looked at a news title that said that, they would go, what are you guys talking about? For them, an apocalypse was actually something really important. If somebody said, I've got an apocalypse, they'd go, wow, okay, let me hear what you've got to say. It would actually be a good thing, not a bad thing. Again, here's an example where we have taken a word and over the centuries, it has changed its meaning. We've got to be so careful to just read the Bible literally and go, oh, that's what it means. No, no, go and find out what the context was and go back to understanding that will unravel the, what the author's intent was. And it's really important for us to understand this. We're going to keep telling you this because we get this so wrong and we land up with, in such trouble when we read the Bible. Anyway, you can see I must get off my high horse right now. Apocalypse actually means unveiling. It means this disclosure, this opening up. Its literal meaning is to break through from hiddenness. Go to the lexicon and you'll see that that's what it says. It's the lifting off. It's the opening of the door that's long been closed or it's the pulling back of a curtain to show what, it was, what that was always there or was hidden was always there. 
So if I go here and I go to this, this, this curtain and I go like this and I go, woohoo! Check, Pete's been behind the curtain the whole time. That was an apocalypse. He was always there. He was hidden from us. And all we did was draw back the curtain to show you what was always hidden. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. Hopefully you can remember that going forward. So the title could actually read, The Breaking Through from Hiddenness of Jesus Christ by Jesus Christ about the person of Jesus Christ. So, different lingerie. Lingerie, different genres <laughs> of literature. Okay, get your, get your minds out the gutter, please. <laughs> there are different genres in this letter, and it's really important for us to understand which genre is happening at that time. Because if we read a particular genre in, the, in a, an incorrect way, we land up with the wrong conclusion. And so often what happens is, is, the confusion with Revelation is because we read it like a newspaper, like a newspaper headline, as opposed to the metaphorical, apocalyptic genre, which most of Revelation is. Yes, it's poetry. Yes, it's um, pastoral. Yes, there's all of those things. But ultimately, the primary genre of literature is the, uh, ap that, upper, that, that, that word, that apocalyptic literature. So let me give you some examples of, of, of how this could read. And I, I know... Um, What's your name again? Quinton. Wow. Quinton was saying that in, currently in Gaza, um, there's a whole bunch of, of Muslim people that have had a, all at the same time, have had a revelation of Jesus and have, have actually given their lives and got born again this week. Amazing, eh? So, if I took that horrific moment in, in Gaza recently or within Israel, and I gave you a newspaper headline, it would read something like this. As we traveled in the jeeps, the soldiers were increasingly dismayed as they saw the death and destruction that was brought upon their city. That's what you would see if you open up a newspaper and a journalist was reporting on it. If it was the apocalyptic or metaphorical thing, it would say, moving along the dark road, And into the land of death, we were overcome by the echoes of demons that had wrecked their havoc. Now, if we read that second one like a newspaper, we would think there were demons there. In some ways, there were. <laughs> But there weren't. There were men who were killing innocent women and children. Or poetry would read, beyond the battle, a city burned and the cries of the dead were silenced. You see the difference. And if we understand what the genre is, We can then read it in that genre to find the right conclusion. All right. So if the main genre is apocalyptic, well, there's two main purposes of op apocalyptic literature. Wow, this word is killing me this morning. It's to set the present moment in all of its uncertainty and all of its anxiety in the unseen realities of both the future and the present. I'm going to say that again because we're going to say this many times throughout the series. It's to set the present moment with all its uncertainty and with all its anxiety in light of the unseen realities of the present and of the future. Got that? All right, so let's have a look at those two things briefly. In terms of the future, Isn't it interesting, and, and for all of us, that's where vision comes from, right? What we dream about. And you, you often see like sporting greats or people have made it, you know, they had this dream. I've actually loved watching the um, documentaries on Netflix. Arnold Schwarzenegger, David Beckham, uh, uh, Sly Stallone, all of those kind of guys. It's actually really interesting to see how their lives develop. But every single one of them had this dream, had this vision about what their lives would be. And they attained it by these small steps consistently doing what they needed to do to achieve what they had. They had pictured what the future looked like and it impacted how they walked out their lives today. Everybody has that same opportunity or ability to do that. But imagine if we were able to see a little bit of the future, if, if, if God would open the curtain like he has and, and, and what's already hidden, just open it for us to see what would it do. 
And that's what Revelation does. It creates this hope. It gives us a vision for how we can live today because of what the future looks like. And we will see that the lamb wins. And guess what? There is no Armageddon, people. The lamb walks in and guess how he overcomes? Through his sacrifice and through his word. Not with a sword. Not with this bloody war that everybody kind of makes it out to be. Go and we will get there. But I'm giving you a heads up. And that was for free. It also comes with warnings though. That if you don't do these things, well, you will land up in different places. Or you will not achieve your dream. You will not achieve your vision. And so that's part of what we need to understand. Dallas Willard says a human mind must have some picture of the future, and that picture determines everything about the present. How are you living your life out in the present based on the future that you know? And as we read Revelation, hopefully that future or that vision that God is giving us, that apocalypse that he's given us, will give us the energy, the vitality to navigate through into what God wants for you as a person, for us as a community, and actually as a church as a whole. I pause for effect. Secondly, the present moment, with all its uncertainties and all of its anxiety, in light, okay, I'm sorry, I actually should, should carry on. The future is also about this fact that there's a new heaven and a new earth. There's a new city. And imagine if you got a revelation of what the new city looks like, maybe it will change the way that you see your city right now and how you can change your city for the good for the city that we are about to inherit in the future. It will also change the way in which you live, which I have said a few times. So now coming back to the, the present moment in light of the unseen realities of the present. See, not everything is as it seems. Like I've said, every moment in history is not what it seems. We can look at Middle East. We can look at the Ukraine war. We can look at what's going on in the United States. I mean, how they've landed up with Joe Biden and and Donald Trump still going against each other. You've got to, I mean, honestly, if those are the two best leaders they've got, this, we're in trouble. But anyway, that's an aside. The point is, is that apocalyptic literature looks to uncover, unveil the hiddenness of the unseen realities in our present moment. And actually, the greatest unseen reality in any present moment is a person, and his name is Jesus. Jesus will always be in that present moment with you. And we'll get into that in a, in, a, in a bigger sense just now. But the crucified, risen, reigning King of Kings, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth will be there because he is the person who is the unseen reality with whatever you are going through. Jesus is telling us that unless we believe this, what we will land up doing is we won't understand what's going on in our world today. And we will land up fearful and making wrong decisions on how to live out our lives. I'm not saying that people shouldn't emigrate. But if you're emigrating just because you're fearful, it's the wrong decision. You need to be going to something. And you need to hear what God is saying to you. Because otherwise you're going to arrive on the other side and it's not where God wants you to be. And you're living outside of his will. And that's the last thing you want to be doing. If God has said leave, then for goodness sake, leave. But don't leave just because it's, you're fearful. Go to God and ask, should we leave? And if God says yes, then leave. We did that. In, in 1997, Louise and I applied for immigration to Australia. We then went and traveled, and I worked overseas in Boston, and we traveled a lot of the world. And God spoke to us very clearly and said, you need to stay in South Africa because that's where your inheritance is. That's why 20 odd years later, we are still here, planted a church, given our all to South Africa to bring about transformation in South Africa in whatever degree we can. The context, some of this context, and we're not going to go through all this, okay, it's written here, all that to whatever, we're going to get there, but we're going to do it in chunks. Rather than give you this kind of lecture, hopefully they're going to be preachers to move you and impart to you the heart of Jesus. So in first century, what you've got is you've got John. Now, some people don't know whether it's John the, the, the apostle. Some think it might just be a, a disciple of Jesus called John. But generally, there's a, there's, a, there's a consensus that it is the apostle John. He's probably 80 odd years old, and he's been put onto this prison island called Patmos. It's, a, it's like Robben Island. It's like Alcatraz. And they're really for these um, political dissidents, people who are not following what the Roman government wants. So he's a troublemaker. He's not bowing to the knee of Caesar. So they send him off to Robben Island. And just to give you some idea of where, where it is, is, there's Jerusalem, Lebanon, Iraq, Turkey. Here's Patmos, just off 
the island of Greece. There's, you know, Italy and where Rome is. So it gives you an idea. This is a real place. It's not some fairy tale. This was, and it still is, a place. Let me give you a little bit kind of more information around where it is. So here are the seven churches. So he's sitting, he's sitting over here on Patmos, and there's all the churches that he's going to speak to in a moment, that Jesus is going to dictate the revelation that he wants John to write down and give it to the churches. To give you an idea of what it looks like, it looks like that. It's like a piece of rock in the middle of nowhere. This is where John was. I, I was going to show you the cave where everybody thinks he had the, the revelation. But oh my God, they, they've, they've just destroyed it with stuffs. Go look online if you want to see. But they've just made it such a religious spot and, and, and tourist thing. Anyway, the point that I'm trying to make is that what had happened was there was Emperor Domitian. Now, again, when was this written? Some believe as early as AD 70. We certainly know, you know that it was after the temple was destroyed because it mentions that. But it's, it's kind of from AD 70 something, somewhere up to about AD 96. It depends on, on, on who you read and, and some of the historical documents. The point is, is that got, most people believe Emperor Domitian was around at, this, at that stage. And he felt that he was a God, and he said, you need to bow down and worship me. You can believe anything you want. You can believe in Jesus, but ultimately, you've got to worship me. So in your private capacity and what you did, you could live out your life as a Christian. But if you were in public, you had to go and bow to the statues of Domitian. Otherwise, you would be put in jail, and you would be regarded as an atheist, a dissident atheist, and sent to the Isle of Patmos or killed, one of the two. And so part of this thing is, is here you have... John, he's on an island, a prison island. He's been taken there. He's been put on his own. And the challenge here is, is that John would have gone through three, three crises. One would have been a personal crisis. Like, like how many of you, have, but God, I've done all of this for you. I, I've done all of what I thought you've asked me to do. And now I'm 80 years old and you've put me in prison on an island with nobody. Can you explain that to me, Lord? Because I thought I was kind of going to get some rewards here. Because isn't that how some Christians believe? Is that if I'm good and if I do all of these things, then God must reward me. It's a cause and effect. I don't see that in the Bible. I only see rewards coming in eternity because of the obedience that I've done on Project Planet Earth. So John would have had to go through this and he would have had to deal with this with Jesus. He was a normal human being like you and me. How many of you are feeling like that right now? Like God, really? I thought, to be honest, I'm there. I've got things that I, I would rather not be doing right now. God, have, I want to get out of this. I want to do this. I want to try this. I'd rather be full-time in the church. I'd rather be studying full-time. But that's not what God's got for me for this season. So I've got to engage Jesus regularly about it and say, God, give me the faith to make the faith steps when the time comes. Let me see what you are saying. Let me hear what you're saying and for you to say, look, and then to take the, the, the step. But I can't hear that if I'm not with him. Secondly, there was an ecclesiastical or church crisis. He was the pastor of those seven churches. Their leader's now gone. The guy who, who was leading them and, and helping them along the way, who knew Jesus, who lay on Jesus' chest, he's no longer around. How do they get pastoral care from this individual? And then theologically, both for himself and for the churches. But but if God is this amazing God who loves us, why has he put his pastor onto a prison island? God, we don't understand. Imagine the apostles when Jesus died on the cross. I mean, remember, for three days, they were like, oh, my goodness, we thought he was the one. <laughs> and he's gone now. And the ones on the road to Emmaus, it's like, oh, gee, we've lost our Messiah. We thought he was the one. Let me take it back. I guarantee you almost every single person here feels or is in some form of one of those crises. And I want to encourage you, take it to Jesus. Because I want to show you what John's response was. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstand, I saw one like the Son of Man. What did John do? He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. 
I, I think often we come to church because we think we, sh- we have to. I would love to change that, that we come to church. And if you're a visitor, this doesn't apply to you, but I hope you, hopefully you land up with a home where you feel like you belong in a community. Hopefully it's here, but if it's not, what I would say to all of us is we get to go to church. We get to come to a place. We had Ian's 60th celebration yesterday, and I loved what he said. We have freedoms that we are not grateful for, and we're always looking at what we don't have, but we have the freedom to come to church freely. There's some people in this world that don't have that. You get to come to church, and on the day of the Lord, you can hear him because you're in a corporate anointing that is way better than an individual anointing. And people don't necessarily understand that. No, I'll watch online. And that's, again, we've got people online watching. That's not to point fingers. That's to say, rather be here. We've got that as a secondary. But rather be here with the people in a corporate anointing to, like the worship. This morning, you don't get that at home. You don't get the sense of what God is doing. And in this moment, what we want to do is we want to be cooperating and positioning ourselves and being empowered by Holy Spirit so that he would reveal his word. Because what is John's, Peter's response to Jesus? Or Jesus' response to Peter on his revelation. That wasn't revealed to you by man. Even as I'm preaching, hopefully, yes, on some level, I'm, I'm, I'm tickling your ears to fancy to try and get you to understand what the Word of God is saying. But ultimately, it's by the Spirit who is going to reveal Jesus to you. And in this setting, it's way more electric, way more kind of depth to it that we get together. So he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day with Jesus, wanting to hear what he had to say, despite his circumstances and despite the crises that he was going through. He heard a loud voice. It sounded like a trumpet. And you see, here we need to understand what's going on. Because why a trumpet? What is that saying? Well, in the Old Testament, it was a call to battle. In some ways, I think when we start church, we should... But it also significantly talks about the presence of the Lord. It talks about let's begin to worship and call the presence of God into our midst. So that's what's happening here. The presence of God is falling in his context, in his circumstances, in a prison, on an island. And then he sees seven golden lampstands. This speaks of the Holy of Holies. In Moses' tabernacle, you've got the six, seven um, um, lampstand thing, which signifies the presence of God. The priest must make sure it's burning all the time, that the presence of God is always there and to keep it burning. And what John discovers in this place is actually the place of prison, an island, becomes his sanctuary. So let me ask you this. Where are you working? Corporate? Retail? IT? Where do you find yourself right now? Well, you can experience God, and that can become your sanctuary from which you work because God is not limited to time and space. All you have to do is position yourself in the Spirit to allow God to come and to reveal Himself to you at any moment. He set the present moment in light of the unseen realities of the present. Despite the uncertainties, despite the anxiety, And then look what he does. He sees the one who looks like the Son of Man in the middle there. Understand what's happening here. Jesus is in the middle of the churches. He's in the middle of the context. He's in the middle of the, he's not up on top. He's not on the side. He's in the middle. He's right in the center of everything that is going down. Every single moment. And I mentioned earlier, I would would kind of expand on this. Think of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're in a fire, but there's a fourth person. Who's there? Jesus is in the middle. And if you go and you look later on, you'll see Jesus is in the middle. We'll get to that in a moment. But you look at Psalm 23. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, guess who's in the middle? Guess who's with me? Jesus. So no matter what you're going through, Jesus can be in the middle. Now the dominant image here is the voice. You've seen verse 10, verse 12, verse 18. And you can see up behind me those references. And what Jesus is basically trying to tell us is that We need a discipline of discipleship to hear what he is saying. If you're not listening to what he is saying, because what Jesus is going to do is dictate to him what he wants to say to each one of these churches. Are you positioning yourself 
to hear what Jesus is saying to you? Are we positioning ourselves as a church to hear what God is going to say to, to us? And that's what it says. The Spirit says. Now, I want to give you some, some help here to understand. There's a literary thing called a chiasm. See, what happens is, is Westerners, we think one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If you're writing to somebody, you write and the conclusion's at the end. In fact, we're told, give a little summary of what you want to say, then say what you want to say, and then summarize what you've said, right? It's this very linear approach, like boom, boom, boom. Here's the point, my conclusion. But you know that the Eastern writers, certainly in the first century, but even today, they write chiastically. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in a moment. And think the kind of Canadian geese in flight, something like this. That's how they write. Okay, Gary, what are you talking about? Well, let me show you. Okay, so in terms of this whole thing, is much of the Bible is actually constructed chiastically because it was written by Middle Eastern people. And certainly, Revelation has, a, has, has chiasms all the way through it. And it's important for us to understand this. And like I said, even today, after 9-11, the Iranian president wrote a letter which was published in the New York Times to the American people. And unfortunately, they just looked at what he said at the end. But his main point was in the middle, which said, why do you hate us so much? And America missed all of that and focused on the conclusion. We've got to be very careful of how we listen to Middle Easterners when they write to us. So, yeah, let me show you. In terms of this apocalypse, this first apocalypse, it's, it's chiastic, chiastically put together. What you can see is the head and the face are linked. So when you think of this V, what you're doing is number one and number seven are the same. Huh? Exactly. But that's the way they write. What you're going to see is the eyes and the mouth are linked. What you're going to see is the feet and the hands are linked. But the main point of all of this is the voice. The voice of rushing water, which we're going to get to. So let me, let me show you a little bit more. So that, as I'm showing you, that's the V of the chiastic setup. Eugene Peterson talks about the head and the face being linked. Number one and number seven. Because that's the impression. When you meet somebody, that's your first impression is the head and the face. Unless it was COVID and then it's a little bit more difficult. But his hair was as white as snow. It's signifying that he's been around a long time and he's immensely wise. It's also talking about that his face was shining like the sun. It's talking about the glory of God. His eyes and his mouth, those are the origins of relationship. It's how we, we talk and how we see and how we see expressions and nonverbal gestures and all of those kind of things. His eyes are like flaming fire. So he's insightful, but he's also purifying. That's why he, he falls as though dead because he goes, oh my goodness, I'm in the presence of holiness. His mouth, like a two-edged sword. Like I said, that's what he comes to judge, but he also comes to save. He also comes to cleanse and to heal with his words. His feet and his hands are organs of capability. It's how we do stuff. You know, beautiful are the feet of those who go and tell of the gospel. And so it talks about this burnished bronze. It's strong. It's steady. It's victorious. It talks about his hands and he holds the seven stars. Now, people believe that there were there were planets, that the seven planets actually ran history. <laughs> Where did that come from? The watches. Astrology. The watches. See, it's all linked. And so in this place, what he's saying is, no, no, the seven planets don't do this. Jesus does, and he holds them in his hand. He holds the whole world in his hand. So I wonder, they should make a song about that. The main point of this first chiasm is to show the inherent authority of the voice of Jesus. Sounds like rushing water. It's like that should drown out. Have you ever been to Big Falls or have you been to Niagara Falls? I mean, you can hardly hear yourself think. It's like, it should be drowning out all the other voices. It should be drowning out the, the, voice, the voices of the world. In, in, in John's case, the demission and the, the threat of sedition, the threat of, um, you know, this whole kind of comfort and convenience and security. Rather live like this. Don't live according to the kingdom. Live within both camps and worship both idols. And you can do this as a Jew, but you can also do this as a Christian and whatever it might be. But if we have and we're with Jesus, it should be the rushing water, the voice of rushing water that drowns out that we only hear his voice. Our very lives depend on it. And this voice gives two commands. Do not be afraid and look or behold. Now the first command of is actually based, or the first command is achieved 
Let me try that again. The second command is achieved by the first one. We will not fear if we are beholding rightly, if we are looking at Jesus, if we are looking at all of this other stuff, the economic, the social, the cultural, the political, the wars, the rumors of wars, the, the rule of militant terrorists and the decay of moral order and all of those kind of stuff, we're not looking at the right things. And we will, as it says in the Bible, our hearts will melt with fear and we will fall away. That's what it says in the end times, men's hearts will melt with fear and they will fall away. Let's not be one of those because we behold Jesus and we know he is victorious in the end. So he's on this prison and he starts to speak and he says, I was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last, same thing. I have the keys to death and Hades. Do not fear. Have a look. See, the voice speaks from the middle. It's not speaking from the sides. That's what happens in Revelation 5, 6. Guess who's at the center, at the throne? Jesus, the Lamb. Is Jesus at the center of your relationship, I mean, of your life? Is it your primary relationship that you have? Or is it just on the margins of your life? You see, I think as a church, if we're honest, if we look just superficially, the church is on the margins. It has become irrelevant in our world system. We see it across the board. And we see the church starting to adopt all of these worldly principles into the church. And the church and the word of God and the kingdom is being diluted. We think we're marginalized, especially in the Western world. But there's more going on. There's more what, what we've seen. There's an unseen reality. There's more going on because Jesus is actually at the center. We think Hollywood. We think uh, Microsoft. We think Apple. We think uh, Google. All of those kind of, those are the ones at the center. They are changing culture. And in some ways they are, but they are actually living on the margins. Because if Jesus is at the center, then his values, what he says, goes. And ultimately that will all be brought back in to the center of who Jesus is. Because at the center is a person. And if you're not working according to Jesus and you're not working towards Jesus, you are not, you are actually on the margins. We think that's the margins, but the margins is actually with Jesus. And we are called to bring those on the margins into the center to meet him. Because when they meet him, then they know that through that process, what's going to happen is, is if you've got an ideology or if you're outside of that synchronicity of who Jesus is, at the end of the age, you will be found on the outside, not on the inside. So we are called as disciples. Not to live on the margins, not to live one foot in, 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 in two camps, but to come into the center of where Jesus is and all the values that Jesus says. So listen and look. And if you're becoming dis discouraged or disorientated or distracted, maybe it's because you think that there's something bigger that you have to get involved in. Maybe you think there's something more attractive, more marketable, more believable than Jesus. I'm here to tell you this morning, maybe rethink that. That's not how you get influenced in this world. If you live at the center with Jesus, don't live on the margins of how the world wants you to be. Don't dog eat dog. Don't try and climb the corporate ladder by climbing on top of people. Maybe be generous and, and actually push other people forward because God will lift you up in his due time. And the point is, as I said, Jesus has not got his gospel and, and, and all of what he's given us to push it through to the margins. We need to bring it into the center where he is. And the way we do that is through repentance. And you'll see when we get to the churches, I have this, you're doing this really well, but this you're not doing well at all. Repent and return to me. What is repentance? It's to change the way we think. It's to actually get God's perspective to find out what Jesus is saying. And when we do that, everything changes. You see, if we were here and you had to say to Jesus, what do I need? He would say, you need an apocalypse. If you're struggling with your relationship with Jesus, you need an ap apocalypse. You need to draw back the curtain and see Peter, I mean, Jesus. To see that there's more to this present moment. That despite the uncertainty, despite the anxiety, actually what's happening here is there are unseen realities, both from the future, which he will reveal, which will give you a vision to actually get there. But also that in the moment, in the present is a person and his name. And the greatest thing about that moment and the greatest unseen reality is Jesus' present. If you're in the fire, Jesus is there. If you're going through the valley of shadow of death, Jesus is there. And he's saying, listen to me, look at me, and I will show you the way. Do not be afraid. We're seeing what's playing out in this world is all of what Jesus has talked about. 
But guess what? We're on the winning side. I'm part of Team Lamb. I don't know what team you're part of. And the thing is, is he says, I'm crucified. I'm the, the, the forever living one. And I've got the keys to death in Hades. And as we know, probably the biggest thing that most people fear is death, but Jesus has the keys. But guess what? He actually has the keys to everything. Everything. Let's stand.